Good afternoon, it's Jeffrey Christian. It's about 2.45 on Friday, the 8th of April here in New York. I have a little bit of a head cold, which uh, I apologize if I cough or my voice is a little rough. And I apologize for being late and probably short on this one um, as a result of feeling not up to par. I wanted to talk about the precious metals markets, give a brief update on our views. Um, and uh, I'll do that. And then I, I will talk a little bit about gold in Russia because uh, it's a topic that is important to the gold market on one level, and it is full of misinformation and misinterpretation on another level. Uh, so I will tell you what's going on in the Russian gold market, and then I'll tell you, well, maybe I won't tell you what isn't going on. Uh, but by extension, you might be able to figure it out. I have a couple of notes at the end about, um, I'm not quite sure what it would be called, but let's say it's the uh, commentary version of survivor bias. Let's get into it. Gold and silver prices. Gold prices rose sharply with the war. Well, first off, let's take a step back. If you look at the course of the first quarter, Gold and silver came into 2022 focusing on inflation and, and inflationary problems. Then interest rates were raised in early March. And even before that, in the advance of that increase, because it was well announced, uh, there was a shift. Oh, yeah, inflation's a problem, but interest rates too. Inflation is a problem that tends to push gold and silver prices up. Rising interest rates is a problem, is a issue that sometimes leads to lower prices, what's going to happen. And, you know, people were discussing these two trends when the Russians invaded Ukraine and the war came front and center. Price rose to a record price of, you know, $2,078, I think, on an intraday basis, 2058 or so maybe on a settlement basis. And then it came back down. And it's been trading between 1915 and 1950. Uh, for most of the last few weeks. And it looked like it was forming a pennant pattern, technically. Uh, there was likelihood that there would be a breakout one way or the other. Our inclination was to think that the price could spike out and it was trading around 1930 this morning. We thought it could go up to 1950. Um, but the options pricing system suggests that the consensus in the gold market was that the breakout would be onto the downside, which had an objective initially around 1915 and a further objective around $1,895. So we have been wrestling all day with this. And while we were debating which way it goes, the price spiked up to 1950, uh, 1952. It's a little bit below that now. Uh, we will be issuing a trade recommendation later today to our clients, and it'll be the gold trade recommendation will be posted on Kitco. Uh, and we probably will be short-term sellers and longer-term buyers. Uh, the outlook ultimately depends on the prosecution of the war. It could go any number of ways, and you know there are scenarios where the Russians uh, regain an upper hand, uh, which could be positive for gold. There are scenarios in which NATO, Western Europe, or the United States gets involved militarily or becomes much more aggressive in living up to its promises to the Ukraine uh, government about supplying arms. And that could be positive in the first instance and negative for gold prices in the second instance. It's hard to say. Um, there are scenarios that could see gold prices rise back to $2,080. There are scenarios that could see gold prices rise over $2,100 on a spike, like we saw for one day in August of 2020 and one day in early March of this year. Um, and there are also scenarios where the price subsides back down into 1780, 1880 range, but we don't think that happens until probably the second half of this year. We don't think it happens earlier because inflation is a problem, and the year-to-year -year inflation data, like we'll see, uh, we'll see March inflation data in the next week. It will be high because in March of 2021, core inflation was about 1.6 percent. 
So whatever the price levels are in March of this year will be measured against much lower price levels last year uh, in March. Once you get into June and you're looking at May data, by May the price levels had already risen so that the percentage change from May of 2021 to May 2022 may be uh, much lower. And we think in the second half, you could see some dissipation of that inflation premium. Also, hopefully we would see some sort of resolution or a movement toward a stalemate with a, de uh, with a militarized zone where Russians are occupying a disputed territory in Eastern Ukraine. You know, there are any number of ways that that could go, but we think that you will see a dissipation of the war premium in gold prices in the second half of this year, probably not in the second quarter. So we're still looking at prices staying high. Interest rates also will have risen perhaps one, one and a half percent by the second half of this year. So the world will be more comfortable with that. And our expectation is that we'll probably see stock prices having revived, possibly moving to new record highs and stronger economic activity in the United States China and, and parts of Western Europe. So that's our view for gold. Silver, very similar, but distinctly more weak than gold. Uh, you haven't seen the war premium applied to silver the way you have with gold. You have seen the, the inflation premium applied to some extent, but silver again continues to suffer relative to gold by a number of investors sort of turned off to silver investments because of the spurious chatter and a high noise to signal ratio, if you will, in the silver market. And those things continue to hang over silver. Silver has a decidedly higher probability to the downside uh, than gold and a decidedly lower probability to the upside than gold, at least for the next few months. So that's that. I wanted to look at this because a lot of people have been asking, monetary largesse does not necessarily mean higher inflation, nor higher gold prices, nor the end of the economic system as we know it. You're hearing people say, well, with all of the money creation, gold prices should be $10,000 or $100,000 and, you know, and, and the, the dollar's got to collapse and inflation's got to rise and 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 this just can't last and you know the chart on the the left is a chart we've used before um uh, it goes through december 2020 i haven't updated it and you can see the blue line is the percent change year over year of money supply m1 money supply in the united states which is very important to pay attention to because you could also use oecd money supply and you get radically different views but just looking at the u.s you can see that we've had various bouts of 10, 20% increases in money supply since 2000, since 1982 that have not caused inflation to rise. And in fact, inflation has declined. Now, in 2020, we had a very sharp increase, a way off the charts increase in money supply as the governments locked down uh, their economies and they pumped a lot of fiscal uh, stimuli into the economies, and there was a lot of monetary largesse to accommodate that fiscal stimulus. You can see on the left, that chart's been updated. You can see the sharp increase in 2020 in M1 money supply growth rates in percentage term of growth rates, and you can see it stayed high for most of 2021, and then it plunged. And it came back down almost to pre-pandemic levels. So we have to see what happens next. In the period from 1982 to 2020, what we've seen is monetary authorities will flood money into the economy when you get into a crisis. It could be a recession and an international debt crisis as it was in 1982 when Paul Volcker invented this theory. It could be a stock market crunch like 1987, a recession like 1991, a uh, default on Russian debt in 1997, a uh, Southeast Asian currency crisis in 1997, a recession in 2000, 2021. It could be all sorts of stuff. You flood money into it, 
get the economy stabilized, and then you sell bonds and suck up the excess money that you've created, and you sterilize the inflationary implications of that monetary largesse. It's been done repeatedly over the last 40 years, not at the levels that we saw in 2020 going forward, but it's worked then and it may well work now. So when people say, well, with all this money creation, why are gold prices so low at record highs around $1,950 an ounce? <clears throat> uh, this money supply means that gold should be $10,000. And the answer is no, it doesn't. You know, first off, money supply does not necessarily translate into higher inflation and money supply creation does not necessarily translate into higher gold prices. There's no quid pro quo. There's no reason to believe that one leads to the other. There's all kinds of empirical evidence to the contrary. It can, but it doesn't have to. And for the last 40 years, it hasn't. So you can believe that if you want to believe it, but you can also look at the statistics and the empirical evidence all around you and say, okay, I'm worried about money supply. I'm worried about sterilizing the inflationary implications in that money supply, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I think that we're gonna have hyperinflation and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna see $10,000 gold or something like that. So that's something to bear in mind. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Russian gold too. And I will go to here. This is a place where you can order our gold yearbook, which we released this week on Wednesday. It's getting rave reviews, uh, even from some people who have uh, helped promote the conspiracy theories and the strange beliefs. Uh, you can buy it. But I want to talk about Russian gold. Uh, and again, there's what's going on in the Russian gold market and what people have been saying. <clears throat> what's been going on in the gold Russian, the Russian gold market is that the, the Russian economy is in really bad shape. And you know, um, I the working title of this uh, presentation was "Sometimes Amazed but Never Surprise, uh, Surprised." You know, we can, we're not surprised to see a tremendous number of apologists on YouTube, especially in the gold market and certain extreme portions of the U.S. political system. Uh, we're not surprised. We've seen this before. We saw it with the America First Party that wanted the United States to break relations with England and France and go to war as an ally of Germany. Um, we've seen it before. So I'm not surprised that we see it. I'm amazed that we see it because it just speaks to the old adage that humanity never learns. Anyway, in the Russian economy right now, they closed the banks. The ruble collapsed, was down to one, uh, one penny per ruble. Uh, goods started drying up, especially imported goods. Food prices and energy prices skyrocketed. People were losing their jobs. It is a very bad economic environment in Russia, and it's getting worse. That you must know because, and I'll get to this a little bit more in a second, because what's happening in the Russian gold market is that in individuals, consumers, I would say investors, but many of these people are not investors, they are simply people who have never invested before, or maybe don't even have investable funds, but they are people who are facing high inflation, food shortages, supply shortages of other goods and uh, goods, and increased impoverishment of the overall economy, and a tightening of the police state. Uh, and they have been buying gold, very large quantities for Russian consumers, but they've been buying gold. And there's actually a big shortage of small gold bars for investors. Now, I imagine some people on the internet will say that that means that there's no gold left the same way that they say there's no silver left because you can't find a silver eagle, but that's not the case. There's plenty of gold there, but the capacity to make small bars in Russia is relatively limited because this level of demand for gold 
has not been seen since the Soviet days. Uh, and they're, they're going for that. So that is the reality. In the Russian gold market, investors, consumers, retail people are buying small gold bars. And you buy them at the banks uh, in Russia. The Russian government has been dealing with um, consequences of its invasion in Ukraine. First, they went to the European who buy their oil and gas and said, we want you to pay for our oil and gas in rubles. Europeans said, no, we have contracts that say we can pay in dollars or euros and we will honor those contracts. Uh, Russian government came back and said, well, you can pay in rubles or gold. Western European consumer, uh, importers said, no, we're gonna pay you in rubles, uh, euros or dollars. <clears throat> and last Friday, the Russian government capitulated and said, you can pay Gazprom Bank in euros and Gazprom Bank will immediately take your millions of dollars every day in euros and use them to buy rubles. And that is what's been happening for the last five business days. And the ruble has recovered sharply. Now, let me rephrase that. The ruble has recovered sharply because the Russian government is taking the euros it gets from its oil and gas exports and using them to prop up the ruble. There's not a lot of rubles in circulation. So when they come in and they say, we need 10 million euros worth of rubles, that puts upward pressure on, on the ruble supply. And that's why the ruble has strengthened. Well, that was going on over the last two, three weeks. The Russian government also pivoted to the mining and refining industries in Russia and said, we will buy your gold through Russian banks at 5,000 rubles per gram. The gold price was about 6,000 rubles per gram in the international market at the time. So at that time, for those guys who really didn't understand what I was saying last week when I explained it all, at that time, it was about a 16% discount. Russian producers and the banks that buy the gold from them in refined form said, why would we take a discount when we can sell this stuff to retail investors, not at the international price, not at the domestic Russian price, but at a premium because there's so much demand for this stuff. <clears throat> so what you saw was A, the Russian government was not pegging the ruble to the dollar, and it was not offering to buy gold at 5,000 or any other price from outsiders. It was offering to buy gold from miners and refiners through Russian commercial banks at a discount to the price that those banks, miners and refiners could get elsewhere. No arbitrage opportunity, no return to a gold standard, no pegging the ruble to gold, no using gold to buy rubles to buy to sell oil or anything else like that you know that's just all noise static so the signal to noise ratio was very uh, skewed to the noise in the west so now the russian central bank has said okay the ruble strengthened five thousand rubles to the gram uh, actually is higher than the international price. So we're not, we're, we're, we're rescinding that offer that no one could refuse or accept. We're refusing that offer that no one accepted. And we will go back to what we've done for 30 years, which is offer to buy gold at a negotiated price related to the price in Russia and the international price at the time of the sale. So you're seeing strong demand for gold from citizens in Russia, and that is being met with a flurry of activity to build new uh, capping units to allow for the creation of these smaller ingots, which is what people can afford to buy. The Russian government apparently has not been buying gold, either in the international market, nor in the domestic market. 
there's no arbitrage, there's no gold standard. It's just a lot of noise. Now, I wanted to talk about one other thing uh, based on a comment that we got from our last video. In statistics, there's a thing called survivor bias in surveys. You see this, for example, with hedge funds. There are various companies that collect performance data from hedge funds and collate it. So they can say, oh, hedge funds had an average return of X percent last year. Now, there's several problems with those surveys. First off, the biggest and best hedge funds tend not to participate. They tend not to give the information to those surveys. So the results are kind of skewed to begin with. The second thing is there's this thing called survivor bias. You know, there are, I'm not sure what the numbers are now. There used to be like 13,000 hedge funds in the United States. It's a lot fewer now. Let's say that's a thousand hedge funds created every year. And let's say there's 990 that close up. There is a very high failure rate in creating hedge funds, especially the smaller hedge funds. So the guys who are collecting the returns collect data from the better performing funds that survive year to year. And the returns of all those hedge funds that are failing don't show up in the averages reported as the average return. That's a survivor bias. The average return of a hedge fund is known to be lower than the published projections but no one knows quite how low because no one collects the data on the losers. So, Ed, gee, it sounds like you really don't respect anybody who disagrees with you, Jeff. And I wanna say that's not true. I have many colleagues and contacts around the world and friends that don't necessarily agree with me. And we have very, good discussions and very interesting discussions. However, I don't go onto these videos or anywhere else and say, hey, I had a really good discussion with somebody who disagreed with me. Actually, I did once, that's beside the point. And I have actually organized debates and conferences with people who disagree with me to put it all out in front of the audiences there. What happens is like survivor bias. People who look at these videos only hear me, only instead of the hogwash. I don't need to say, hey, this guy had a very good point. And sometimes when I hear somebody give a good point, I change my mind. I change my attitude, just like any other sentient animal would do. Um, but you, as a reader or a viewer of these things, only hear my reactions to stuff it really needs to be reacted to. Not that I don't listen to other people, not that I don't change my attitudes or understandings or analysis based on new information that comes in. I'm constantly accepting new information from all over the world, from a full range of political and economic spectra of realistic, honest, unbiased information. There are people that I know that I, don't have to read because I know their personal biases. There are people that I have to read because I know their personal biases. And there are people that post garbage either personally against me uh, or on comments about this that really sort of warrant returns. But just because you only see me saying, Jane, you ignorant slut, about something stupid that someone's posted about me, doesn't mean that everybody who disagrees with me gets uh, the attention in public. So think before you say something. I always try to. Uh, you know, in the army, they always say it's think, aim, shoot, but soldiers shoot, aim, think. Um, yeah, think before you uh, speak and read before you think. Have a good weekend. Take care. Take care of yourself and everybody around you, and we'll talk to you next week.